morning, everyone. Good morning. You're all very welcome here this morning. Great to have you. I want to read just one verse from Hebrews, and Hebrews chapter 4, where the writer or the preacher makes this statement, this invitation, this encouragement to us. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. When we gather like this, we are coming collectively to meet with God, to approach that throne of grace as the preacher describes it, to be reminded of the mercy that God has shown us in Jesus, and to avail of the grace that God so willingly wants to lavish on us. So let's take a few moments to still our hearts and our minds, prepare ourselves to worship. Let's come and speak with our God together. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we come to tell you of your greatness, of all that you are, all you have done, all you have given. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. We come to tell of your power and might, your mercy and love and goodness. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. We come to tell of your faithfulness, the promise of your word, the revelation of your Son, the living presence of your Holy Spirit. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. We come to lift up our voices, to proclaim your wonderful name, to rejoice in your faithfulness, to offer you our worship, our thanks, our love, our service. Great is your name, and greatly to be praised. Heavenly Father, receive this time set aside for you. Accept the worship we bring. Speak to us through all that we share. Deepen our sense of wonder. Increase our sense of joy. Strengthen our sense of trust. Encourage our sense of thanksgiving. Help us to know more fully in our hearts so that we may show your greatness more completely in our lives and that we may live always and only to your glory. Great is your name and greatly to be praised. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand. We're going to worship together as we sing before the throne of grace, the throne of God above, and King of Kings, Majesty. Let's stand. Let's worship God together.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can come to you with our requests and that you will answer them. That you care for us enough to listen to us. That you care for us enough to help us. That you show us so much compassion, even when we don't deserve it. That when we are unwell, we can turn to you. When we feel helpless or desperate, we can rely on you. When we are not sure where to go or where to turn, you will guide us. Father, thank you that you give us everything that we need. Father, we pray for the Christian church throughout the world, and especially in places where religious faith is suppressed and where Christianity is an un unwelcome minority. We ask for the protection of the people and for all who worship in areas that are dangerous. Lord, that they will take courage from their faith in Jesus. We will remember all those in prison for their faith. And we ask, Lord, that you help them to keep their faith in these difficult times and rely on you through their times of trial. Lord, let their example, let the example of, the, of these persecuted brethren embolden us and strengthen our faith. Encourage us to spread your good news. Lord, we pray for all those around us in the area who don't know, yet, don't know Jesus yet. We ask, Lord, that you move and work in the hearts of those who live locally and draw them into church, Lord. Encourage them to come to Messy Church or to send their children to youth club. Give us the opportunities to reach out and have conversations with people about church and help us to invite both people who live nearby and also those in our lives, our families and our loved ones. We know that if we pray for these opportunities, Lord, you will provide them. So we ask for the confidence and the boldness to ask for these opportunities with reassurance you are with us in these times. Father, let us now take a moment to bring the names of anyone who is struggling with illness or poor health to you. We ask, Lord, that you would restore them and bring them wholeness to their minds and bodies. And Lord, we pray for the medical professionals involved in their care. Give them the necessary skill and compassion. Let your healing power flow through them and bring comfort and relief to those who need it. Father, we saw last night yet another bout of violence and rioting across the UK, with 10 PSNI officers hurt last night in London there. Father, we know there are deep feelings of hurt and distrust on all sides of these protests, and there are things fueling these riots that we cannot relate to. Lord, it feels like our nation is further dividing and things look quite bleak at the moment. Father, we ask that you speak into this situation. Bring peace to these riots. Stop those on all sides who wish to spread destruction and violence and help them find better, more productive ways to voice their concerns. Father, we, we know there is no place for hate and we know that there is neither Jew nor Greek in your eyes. Help us to remember this and as a nation remember this and let it act as a model for our behavior. Father, we ask all those in leadership in the country, listen to the people involved in these protests. Let them feel heard so that they don't turn to further violence. Help our politicians to act with wisdom and grace in this situation and offer solutions that will make a positive difference for everyone. And help us all to recognize the fake news and falsehoods that are being spread online that are attempting to fuel the flames of division further. Give us the discernment to know what is true, Father. And we pray for all those who are suffering as a result of the violence, those who have been hurt or who have suffered destruction to their property. Be with them, Lord. Let them know your comfort in this terrible time. Father, we pray for our own congregation. We pray that all present here today and all connected with the church know your power. Fill everyone here today with your Holy Spirit and a zeal for you, Lord. Give us ideas and inspiration for new things that will help build your kingdom. We thank you, Father, for all the kingdom work that is already going on here in Stormont. And while some of the groups and organizations have stopped for the summer, we pray your blessing on them. Help all those who lead in the youth club, YF and other ministries 
enjoy the break the summer gives them, help them to be renewed and refreshed, and give them time to consider how they can best serve you further in the new term. Father, we pray for Alban. Lord, we thank you for how he serves and ministers to us all and for the work he continues to do, the work that he does behind the scenes as well and the work he does with his council and assembly buildings. Lord, we thank you for him. And as he speaks today, let the Holy Spirit guide and inspire him. Help him speak the words that all of us need to hear and open our hearts and our ears to your good news and prepare us to receive your word today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Before we turn to look at that passage together, we're going to sing this piece that begins with this statement that great is the darkness that covers the earth. It, it's a description of our world. It's a description of our society. And sadly, it's an apt description of our city in the last couple of weeks. But it goes on to make a plea and a request of God that He would send His Spirit Come, Lord Jesus. So let's make this our prayer uh, as we come and worship together. Great is the dark.
Let's pray for a moment. Father, we come asking for your help today, praying that you will open your word to us and open us to your word. Speak, Lord, through your word and through your spirit that we might hear and receive and respond to your living word for us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jennifer was reading that short passage from Matthew chapter 9, I wonder what it was that caught your attention. Was it the fact that it was a short reading? Or were there particular words that kind of leapt out at you? Maybe the word pray, and in particular the pray for workers. Maybe it was the, the sense of Jesus sending people out to go and share the good news. We can be often attracted to those kind of words in Scripture, those action words, those verbs that that call for us to do something. Because that's our instinct, isn't it? To always wanting to be doing something. Over the last few weeks, we've been thinking together about leadership and what leading together looks like. And we've been thinking about this, particularly with the prospect in um, a month or two of nominating people and then subsequently electing people as additional elders in our faith community. We've been trying to think about what leadership needs to look like, what it is shaped like when we model it on Jesus. And therefore, we've been trying to think about what the individuals we might nominate or elect might need to be able to bring to the table, so to, so to speak. This passage may not strike you as being the most obvious one to look at in the context of leadership, but actually it has within it something core and fundamental to leadership, not just in the church, but in our communities and in our country and indeed in our world. As Matthew paints this picture for us, he paints a picture of Jesus active. He's been preaching and teaching. He's been traveling around the villages and the towns. He's been healing people. He has been doing the work of ministry and mission, what he came to do. And the disciples have been following him. But then Matthew tells us that as Jesus uh, appears or comes in front of this large crowd, he pauses all that activity, all the preaching, all the teaching, all the healing. He pauses that just for a moment, and he does something else. You see, following Jesus and being part of Jesus' church as a member or indeed as a leader can become very task-driven. And we might look at what Matthew records here and say, well, there you go, Jesus is doing all these tasks, so we should do the same. We live in a world that's driven by agendas and to-do lists. Hands up all the people who've got to-do lists. There you go. And those who don't, you've got some other way of keeping a track of the things you have to do. You may not call them to-do lists. But we set about fulfilling those tasks each day. It's never-ending, a to-do list. It can be energy-sapping, it can be life-draining. And it's as true for the person who commutes to work, raises a family, cares for a relative, studies, searches for employment, wrestles with health issues, faces illness, as it is for anybody engaged in ministry and service within the church. Life can be very task-driven. 
So it's telling that Jesus, before he issues any further instructions to his disciples, before he sets them tasks, before he gives them an agenda, he does something very, very significant. Because Jesus looked around him, and he saw people, not a project. It's, Matthew records in verse 36 that Jesus saw people, and he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. That's really our core text for this morning. That's the one statement from this reading that I want you to take away. Jesus saw people, and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw people, and he had compassion on them. He saw people and not a project. He saw individual lives, not an itemized list of tasks. The last week or two, we have seen lots of gatherings in our city and across the UK. And amid all the hatred and the violence and the rioting, the protesting and the counter-protesting, what has emerged, at least as I've looked upon it, what I've noticed is how quickly labels are used to describe a certain group or community of people, and how in turn those labels lead to false assumptions, to misunderstandings, to discrimination, and to division. And all too quickly, the people in those groups or those communities cease to be viewed as people, and they're seen as a problem, a problem that needs to be removed. And that's as true on one side of the protest as it is on the other. How we look at people, how we view people, shapes the way we engage with them, respond to them, react to them, reach out to them, or not, as the case may be. How we view them shapes all of that activity. When labels are applied, and let's be honest, we all do it. We all label people. But when we do so, especially if those labels are derogatory or prejudicial, what we're really doing is reducing that person, those people, that community, to being something less than us, to being something other. They're not like us. They're different. They're not the same. They're not one of us. They don't belong. That's how that thinking often proceeds. Language Accent, skin color, cultural expression, all of these can enrich our society, can make it a multicultural, make it a colorful, a diverse place to be. But at the same time, as we've seen in recent weeks, language and accent and skin color and cultural expression, that can be the excuse for hatred and bigotry and racism, and it can lead to division rather than unity. I'm not a politician. I've never had any aspirations to be a politician. And I'm not a social commentator, though I observe what's going on in the society around me. So I'm not really in the place, I'm not really equipped to give the critique necessary 
of the vast array of social and health and educational and employment issues that face our society. But we're all familiar with those challenges. We're all familiar with the crisis facing each of those aspects of our society. What I do want to say this morning is this, that those who have come to our country from another part of the world, who have made their homes here, who have filled the vacancies in our health and caring professions, as well as many other areas of our modern society, they have done so to our collective benefit. And so they deserve to be treated with respect and honor as we would respect anyone who's indigenous to this place. And those who've had to flee from war or famine or poverty or persecution, these people are not problems. These people we are called to love to encourage, to welcome, and to support. If our city cannot be a refuge, then what does that say about us? As a faith community, as followers of Jesus, we have a responsibility and a calling to model respect and honor as Jesus did. We've recently finished a long journey through Mark's gospel, and as we followed that narrative, we discovered time and time again how Jesus engaged with everyone that He met. He didn't gravitate towards the people that were like Him, who had the same tastes and preferences, who followed the same football team, who ate from the same chippy, who shopped at the same supermarket. He engaged with everyone. And in particular, we noted that Jesus responded and reacted to those whom society had chosen to shun those whom society had chosen to marginalize, those whom society had chosen to reject. So as we continue to think through what leadership looks like for a faith community, what's required of those who are called to serve as elders or leaders in a community like ours, then how a person views others especially those who are different from them in some way. That's a good indicator of how well they know Jesus. Jesus looked at the people, and He had compassion on them. I think it was back in the late 80s, 90s, there was a a kind of a fad uh, emerged, particularly within Christian circles, to wear a little uh, wristband that said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? It, it took off. Everybody was wearing them. But before you can determine what would Jesus do, you have to learn to see what Jesus sees. You have to learn to look at the world around you as Jesus does. And that means you have to look at the people around you as Jesus does. We need to learn how to see others as Jesus sees them. 
We need to look at the people around us, the people we share a community with, those that we have a natural affinity with, and those we consider different, those we love spending time with, and those we would rather avoid spending time with. We need to look at all and have compassion on all. Our words will ring hollow. We might subscribe to love your neighbor and say that is the definitive instruction that Jesus gives us. But subscribing to that statement, saying that's true, we believe that, and yet failing to deliver means we don't really accept it. When Jesus was asked, who is my neighbor? He told that extraordinary story that shocked his listeners and helped us to redefine what neighbor is. It's not just the person who lives next door to you. It's anyone who shares this world with us, this life with us, anyone who needs our help and support, our love and our compassion. Jesus looked at the people and had compassion on them. The word that, that Matthew uses here for compassion, the actual Greek word means intestines. In other words, this compassion is not that kind of, oh dear, oh that's, just, oh, 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 that's too bad. Oh, what a shame. Oh, those poor people. And then we turn the channel and we continue to eat our three-course meal. That's not compassion. Compassion is what starts in here and disturbs your innards and therefore disturbs your heart and your soul. It disturbs your whole being. It leaves you unable to do anything other than to cry out to God on behalf of those who are in need. It is that which stirs us to say to God, what can I do to make a difference to those who are hurting, to those who are in need? That's the meaning of the Greek word that Matthew uses that we translate as compassion. So where does that compassion take us? Well, it takes us firstly, as Jesus instructs here, to our knees. Jesus called his disciples to pray. As followers of Jesus, as leaders in his church, on our knees at prayer is our starting point. It reminds us that the task to serve and to follow is not one that we can do in our strength or indeed on our own. Notice how Jesus calls them to pray for workers, plural. You and I are not called to be lone rangers. We're called to work together with others in the community of faith, reaching out with the grace and love and the forgiveness of God. Prayer is a vital part of how we respond to the darkness. As we sung that piece just a few moments ago that allowed us to express the reality, and if you were thinking about the words as, as you sung them, you would have discovered just how apt they are for today, even though that particular piece was written, I don't know how many years ago, 20 years ago at least, maybe 30? It's not recent. Now, I know it seems very modern. That's because we tend to sing hymns from the 17th, 18th, 19th century. But it's not. And yet, it describes perfectly the world that we're in. And it gives us the perfect response. Come, Lord Jesus, pour out your Spirit on us today. That's a prayer. It's a dangerous prayer. It's dangerous because... That's exactly what Jesus wants to do. That's exactly what God wants to do. And when we make that our prayer, that's what He will do. And when His Spirit comes, 
then we will be stirred. When His Spirit comes, then we will be empowered to do just as Jesus did. So praying is not, oh, we'll just pray for you. Praying is the core thing. It's the starting place. And so our compassion, says Jesus, takes us firstly to our knees. And then our compassion takes us to our neighbors. Jesus sent out his disciples to the towns and villages. He didn't send them to other countries at this point point. He didn't send them on long missionary journeys at this stage. He sent them to the neighborhoods, to the villages, to the places nearby. Matthew's already told us that that's what Jesus was doing himself. You see, here's the, the model. I want you to grasp this. This is really important. Here's the model. Jesus never asks us to do something he hasn't already done himself. God never asks us to do something he hasn't already done himself. So when we come to seek others to help us, it is much more inviting. It's much more convincing. It has much more merit if we can say, I'm doing this come do it with me, rather than, I think you should do that. I think the church should be doing that. Well, the church should be speaking up. The church should be out there. The church should be helping those people. Guess what? The church is not this. Church is not the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, the Institute and its central headquarters and assembly buildings in the middle of Belfast. That's not the church. Guess what? You are the church. Jesus never asks us to do something he wasn't prepared to do himself. Our task in our generation is to do the same, to go in Jesus' name, with Jesus' authority, to serve our communities, our towns, our villages, to share the gospel, that transforms and brings healing and hope. And that means engaging. It means investing. It means building relationships. And it means opening ourselves up to others. And that's where it gets messy. That's where it gets dangerous. That's where it gets uncomfortable. The call to go into the streets is not, of course, a call to impose or demand or harangue. It's a call to share, to serve, to show grace and generosity, to show the goodness of God. It's tempting though, isn't it? Tempting to kind of withdraw or not really engage. Tempting to stay one step removed from the trouble and the hostility and the divisions. That's not what Jesus calls us to. Whether we are members of His church or leaders in His church. There's a lot of words on this uh, slide, but I make no apology because I wanted you to see them together. It's taken from Matthew chapter 5, so a little earlier in Matthew's narrative. It's part of that uh, portion of Matthew that we sometimes describe as the Sermon on the Mount. So these are Jesus' words, and this is uh, Eugene Peterson's translation. Let me just read it to you first of all. If you can't see the small writing, don't worry, just listen to the words. This is Jesus. Let me tell you why you are here. You are to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. 
You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine, keep open house, be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. There's masses of things we could say on the back of that. But just look at the pieces I have highlighted and underlined. You're here to be salt seasoning. You're here to be light. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God. With Jesus, the call here is not to be spectacular or even to be novel. The call is to live compassionately, not just talk about it. It's a call to befriend and engage and respect and give, give time, give love, give life. And as Jesus continued to prepare His disciples for this next phase, they had spent a considerable amount of time following Jesus, being with Him, observing Him, learning from Him, watching what He said and what He did, and how He responded and reacted and engaged with people. They'd done all of that. Now was the time for them to go out and do what they had witnessed Jesus doing. And as He prepares them for that, He says to them in Matthew 10 and verse 8, Freely you have received, freely give. So what's that going to look like if we go out to freely give what we have received? Well, let me offer you just a few very simple first steps. It might be as something as simple as a friendly smile. Just a friendly smile. You know, not, not everybody that you meet in the street wants to make eye contact with you. And, and even those that you make eye contact with, they don't really want to do anything more than that. So when I meet somebody in the street and manage to get eye contact and smile at them, they probably think I'm a weirdo. But you know what? I'm okay with that. I'd rather they saw a smile than a scowl. Or maybe it's an encouraging word, a, a thank you to someone, a word of appreciation. Maybe it's a word of introduction. A, a, I'm Alban, who are you? Because that's an invitation to relate. It's a delighting in the other. You know, one of the things I've discovered over all the years I've stopped counting now, that I've been doing this job. Here, here's, here's one of the things I've discovered. It's really easy to get people to talk. Did you know that? All you've got to do is ask them a question about themselves. And sometimes you never have to say another word for hours. But that's okay. So long as you stay engaged, so long as you stay focused, so long as you take time to get to know them. I read a book a number of years ago, quite a number of years ago, and in the introduction, the author tells this story, but someone he got to know who had come to faith in Jesus. 
And this particular individual had been following a different faith entirely. And he turned up to a, a business event, conference, and there was that normal meet and greet. Everybody was kind of circulating. But this guy was kind of standing on his own. And so, person, another person who was at the event wandered over and said, I am so-and-so, who are you? And they started a conversation. And that conversation led to meeting at breakfast the next morning. And all that the, the person who had initiated the conversation did was to keep asking questions. And this guy, who wasn't a Christian, kept answering them, explaining what his faith journey and what his religion taught him. And so this other person just kept listening, asking more questions, and so they agreed to meet up. And for the next three months or so, they met regularly for breakfast and kept having these conversations. Eventually, after about three months, the guy who was doing all the talking said, look, um, you've heard all about me and my religion. Um, tell me about yours. So the guy started to talk about his faith in Jesus. And they kept meeting. And after about another three months, the guy who wasn't a Christian, who followed a different religion, came to believe in Jesus. He did so not because the other person preached at him from the get-go, but because the other person listened, valued, respected, took an interest. I'm not saying that the next time you say to somebody, I am and who are you, it's going to lead to that, but who knows? Will it always be as well received? It's nice to tell those positive stories, isn't it? No, it's not always going to be well received. Sometimes you're going to have people say, I don't want to know. That's enough. Happens to me regularly. No, I don't want you to pray. Don't want you to come back. That's okay. Jesus prepared his disciples for that very eventuality. He said, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home, that town, shake the dust of your feet. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Compassion, you see, is not blind. It's not foolhardy. The call here is to be generous, but not to be unwise. We're going to go into a broken, a dangerous world, and Jesus made it clear to his disciples that it wouldn't be easy and it wouldn't be pain-free, that they would face challenges and difficulties and opposition. But Jesus said, don't worry, don't be afraid, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. We're not on our own. Following Jesus, leading in Jesus' church brings with it bumps and bruises and all sorts of challenges. But here's the encouragement. Here's the reassurance. What God calls us to do, He equips and empowers us to do. The disciples began as a motley crew of 12, but they would become leaders and teachers and wise counselors to those who would become followers of Jesus in the early years of the emerging church. And that pattern still follows today. It's those who follow who are called to lead, because it's in following that we learn to lead. Jesus looked at the people, and he had compassion on them. This is our calling as followers and leaders in today's church, in this faith community here in Stormont. So as we prayerfully consider who to nominate and subsequently to elect as additional elders, let's ask God to show us those who have a compassion for others, whose hearts are inclined as Jesus was to those harassed and helpless 
as sheep without a shepherd. And as we pray for that discernment, let's also pray that God would soften our hearts, that we too would have compassion for those who are harassed and helpless as sheep without a shepherd, that we would see others as Jesus sees them, and that we would serve others as Jesus serves them. Let's pray. Father God, your word speaks so significantly and specifically into our lives and into the situations that we face, whether it's with family, whether it's with neighbors who live beside us, whether it's with acquaintances and, or a network of friends or, or people we work with or whatever it may be, Father, we thank you that we are not on our own in any of those circumstances. And that when those situations and opportunities arise to answer a question, to share something of our lives, you will give us the words to say. So I pray right now that you will come by your Spirit and give us compassion. Compassion that breaks our hearts for others, irrespective of who they are and where they've come from, that we might see our world as Jesus does, with compassion, and that we might seek to serve and to share Jesus with this world that you've placed us in and the people that you've brought us into contact with. May all we say and do honor and glorify your name. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So it seems very fitting that we should finish our time together here in the sanctuary by singing together, filled with compassion. And then we invite you to join us for tea and coffee as church continues um, in the foyer. Let's stand. Let's worship God.
Now may the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ and the extravagant love of God the Father and the intimate friendship and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you now and always. Amen. Amen.